for English subtitle. Push the subtitle button. Hallo liebe Reptil TV Gemeinde zu einer neuen Folge von Reptil TV. Entgegen dem Tierchen hier in der Hand, man wird es vielleicht vermuten, äh, bin ich hier nicht in Indonesien, ich bin in, in Florida. Genau genommen bin ich äh, in, in Gainesville bei Bill Brandt. Es ist die größte Reptilienfarm der Welt, die ich, heute, äh, die ich euch heute vorstellen will. Aber noch mal kurz zu meinem Intro-Tierchen. Äh, seit einigen Folgen habt ihr ja gesehen, habe ich immer so ein schönes Intro-Tier bei mir. Und dieser Boleni hier, der hat es mir besonders angetan, äh, Morelia Boleni, ne? äh, Bolens Python, einer der seltensten Python der Welt. Ähm, wir werden es nachher sehen, der Bill probiert die auch zu züchten. Und ähm, deswegen habe ich mir hier einen von diesen wunderschönen Bolenis geschnappt, um mein Intro hier zu machen. Ja, hier bin ich mit Bill, Bill Brandt. Er ist der Besitzer der größten Reptilienfarm der Welt, würde ich mal behaupten, oder der Reptilienzucht der Welt, ähm, äh, The Gourmet Rodent, bzw. The Animal Company. So Bill, uh, thank you for inviting me, for showing me around. Um, so you, you allow me to see your whole facility, you, you show me around, right? Yes, welcome to Newberry, Florida, and we hope to show you a few interesting things. I'm sure it will be more than interesting. <laughs> Wie wir wissen, ist in Amerika alles größer. Wir sehen hier die Frontseite von The Gourmet Road bzw. The Animal Company. Also dieses ganze Gebäude, äh, 20 Meter tief, ist die, die Zuchtanlage. Und jetzt kommt der größte Gag. Es ist nicht dieses eine Gebäude. Es sind vier so Gebäude. Also wir haben hier die Straße runter, das obere Gebäude, werden wir reingehen nachher. Dann haben wir hier das mehr oder weniger Hauptgebäude, beziehungsweise hier ist das Büro vom Bild drin. Dann hier unten geht es weiter, schließt noch ein Gebäude an, hinten dran kommt nochmal. Also wir haben vier riesige Gebäude, die ich euch jetzt, oder die wir nacheinander jetzt hier durchgehen und ähm, die einzelnen Abteilungen besuchen werden. So Bill, where where we go first? Uh, we're going to go to the Colubrid building. Uh, it will be the first place where we produce uh, many tens of thousands of colubrids. Okay, also zu den Nattern. Also jetzt um es noch mal deutlich zu sehen. Das ist hier die Seitenansicht des Gebäudes. How many how many colubrids are in this building? What do you think in in numbers? Hmm, adults. Uh, between five and six thousand adults, wouldn't you say, Mike? I'd say it's probably sixty-three hundred adults. Sixty-three hundred, and then uh, babies or grow-outs, another goodness. Um, With uh, grow-outs, we probably have another, probably another um, four thousand. Okay. Um, and then a few hundred uh, generic animals for sale. Okay. Also über zehntausend. Natan, allein hier in diesem Gebäude. Okay, so this is the the way you keep it in the this rack system like this. Okay, mm -hmm. and you you have the you said the colubrids, so you have the uh, corn snakes and the uh, uh, lampropeltis, different type of. We have we have many corn snakes. Uh, we also produce many uh, king snakes, lampropeltis. Uh, both the uh, Getula kings, which would include the California kings and the Florida kings, and uh, but we also do some of the uh, tricolor kings, such as this Honduran milk snake here. So okay. So this is the. These are like, animals that are being. These are animals that are being grown out for uh, breeders. So those you keep back, you want to, you want to keep. Uh, for yes, we know. hold these back for our breeder stock. Okay. When we. Uh, grow out our, our colubrid snakes. We, we have three different size cages. The babies we start off in a, a smaller um, cage, which is the size of a shoebox. The uh, next size is this size here, uh, and then we finally put them in a large adult size cage. So this is the medium size 
and these animals are somewhere around uh, 80 to 110 grams. So, hier kommen wir jetzt in den Zuchtbereich. Man kann sich jetzt hier mal ganz gut die Größenordnung vorstellen. So these are all breeding stock. This is all breeding stock here. Yes, this is all breeding stock here. Uh, these are uh, various colubrid snakes that we're breeding. There's a Thayer's King snake there. Or the Thayer's King. Um, uh, we have eight different uh, colonies here. Each colony starts every six weeks. Therefore, this, for instance, this colony starts on July the 15th. And when I say start, I mean it comes out of hibernation or brumation. Uh, the next colony after this would be on September the 1st, and so on and so forth throughout the year. This enables us to produce colubrid snakes year-round rather than producing all of them on one particular time schedule. It will not be possible if you would have all the babies to the same time and the rest of the year you have nothing. So this is why you split it in, in, eight, in eight cycles. It would be very difficult for us to manage all of the babies at once. During the course of a year we'll produce uh, in the neighborhood of 30 to 40,000 colubrid snakes. And so if we produce them all on one cycle it would be very difficult to deal with. Now our customers have become accustomed to the fact that we can give them colubrid snakes year round. So this is uh, specially holdbacks you have here or what do you have here? Correct. These, all of these animals uh, are being held back to be breeders. Uh, so at some point in their life they'll be moved into one of the colonies to fill an open spot and uh, become a full-fledged breeder. And this one is a creary or what is it? This is a, uh, a great band king snake. Um, this is part of our granite project. Um, we're breeding out the bands uh, in our gray bands, and this is uh, this is one of our crown jewels in our gray band colony. So, what is this? This is a this is the first albino theri, uh, uh, Thayer's king or variable king uh, that we know of that is pure that's been hatched out so far anywhere in the world. Okay, so it hatched here just by occasion, or just by occasion. It just popped up in our colony. In fact. Um, in this group, in this clutch of eggs, we hatched out this phase, a, uh, another uh, phase of albino, which is a, a much whiter animal, uh -huh. and then completely black melanistic animals as well. So they, they came all from, from one clutch? Yes, all three of these phases came out of uh, one clutch and just randomly popped up in our colony. It's also natürlich auch interessant to see, wie selbst in der heutigen Zeit, wo man denkt, es ist schon alles gezüchtet, doch neue Tiere einfach durch Zufall in der Zucht auftauchen. Da sind wir wieder bei 1 zu 10.000, die Wahrscheinlichkeit eines Albinos. Wenn man nur genug Eier hat, dann tauchen auch so Tiere drin auf. We hatched out our first scaleless, uh, leucistic scaleless Everglades rats as well. Let's see if we can find a good one. Pretty soon, I started. This is uh, Everglades rat snake, right? Correct. This is a scaleless uh, leucistic Everglades rat snake. So this is the the safe here. Yes, this is this is where one of a kind animals go, so that they don't go home with somebody else. <laughs> Abgeschlossen hier. Nicht schlecht. So here we, we are standing in one of your incubators, right? Yes, this, uh, we incubate our colubrid eggs just in a room. We keep it at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not really sure what that is in centigrade, maybe what, 27 degrees centigrade or something like that. Um, uh, when we, we try to keep good records on uh, our colubrid snakes. For instance, this box that, we're, uh, that I'm opening here, uh, if you look at the, the eggs in here, uh, these eggs were laid on June the 20th, uh, and they were from female number 1004. And so we can track down the information on our, on our uh, animals that we hatch out. And we've kept a 
pretty good records on these for the, since 1996, uh, and we have a database since that time. And we do this so that we can manage our colony, so that we can basically select for animals that are more productive, uh, you know, or they grow to a larger size or something like that. We can make those kinds of selections. We also select for those animals that are less represented within the colony uh, genetically. So if we have a choice between holding back snakes from one clutch that is well represented in the colony genetically or another clutch that is not, uh, we take the one that's not so that we don't get too much inbreeding into the colony. Hmm. So here are some babies hatched uh, the last few hours. Yes, these are uh, scaleless Everglades rat snakes. And this, by the way, the incubation medium that we have here is perlite. Uh, this is what we set up all of our colubrid eggs on and also all of our leopard gecko eggs. So you said you, you hibernate them in, in cycles. You said eight cycles. So uh, what, what temperature you hibernate them and how long the colubrids? We uh, hibernate them for about three months, and we do it at 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which I believe is 11 degrees centigrade. Okay, for three months you cool them down to 11 degrees Celsius, like, and you, you go slowly or more or less like from one day to the next? We, uh, we actually go through about two weeks of what we call purging, where we don't feed them for about two weeks, but uh -huh. we keep them at right around 80 degrees in temperature. And then uh, when it's our due date, for instance, on the, sep uh, you know, on the September colony, we would actually start cooling them on June the 1st. Uh, and it goes from 80 degrees down to 52 degrees in one day. Okay. We yeah. don't do it gradually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I found out the same in, in I, even in the nature. I think it's the same thing or not. It gets cold from one day to the next. It's not yeah. like within one week or two That's weeks, right. like we we liked or we, what what some people uh, was thinking. Yeah. We we used to do a gradual cool down, but now Makes we just no don't sense. even bother. Yeah. 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 Ja, wir haben gerade Spaß gemacht. Es war gerade so schön, im, schön kühl im Inkubator. Jetzt sind wir hier draußen wieder in der Sonne von Florida, 35 Grad. Es ist echt scheiße heiß heute. Ne? Und im Inkubator mit 28 Grad war es angenehm kühl. So, what, what is the next we do, Bill? What section? I think we should go on and take a look at some of the ball pythons in here. Okay, let's check the balls. Check Bill's balls. So we are here in the ball python section, right? Yes, this is our breeder ball python section. Um, overall, we have approximately 5,000 female ball pythons in our operation. Not all of these are up to breeding size at the moment, but approximately 2,800 to 3,000 of them are. Uh, we actually manage our col ball python colony a little bit differently than many other people do. We actually don't cycle them. We, we breed them as they become Uh, as their follicles start to develop in them. Uh, and so what we do is we use the ultrasound machine a lot in our operation. We basically, all females that are of an appropriate size, we will be uh, ultrasounding them at least one time per month, which means that we do at least 3,000 ultrasounds per month. As soon as their follicles are have hit 1.2 centimeters in diameter, Uh, we then put them, bring them into this section here, which is what we call our production section, uh, and we start breeding them. We have the system that we have. We use two males that will be used for about five different females. We designate which males will go with which females, and then the person who is breeding them will go ahead and present the males to the females uh, three different days per week. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they're presented to a new female. Each of the, the, the two females that are servicing the five females are presented uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday of each week. So, and then you, you wait for a while and then you, you go back after some weeks or some months? Or? Yes, after about two weeks, we then go back and do, it, do that uh, same uh, uh, presentation again. So, so the male took a break for two weeks then and then no, going back? Really, the male gets about a one week break on that that way. In other words, uh, so, okay, one, one male for uh, five, six females, yes, yes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay, so more or less like just for one night or what? Yes, yes. One night. And the, the ultrasound machine, how, how you use it? Uh, you, um, I mean, you, you hold the Python just like yes. this and do it here? Or? Yeah, yes, we actually, and I, I'm not the guy that does this, but what we do is we take the female out uh, and we have the probe on the, on the machine. We run the probe uh, over the, 
at the appropriate area uh, on her where we can where we can see it. And the technicians who do this are very good at knowing exactly where to go. And it uh -huh. takes them just less than a minute to okay. do the ultrasound of, okay. of the female. We then record the where her follicular development is on that particular date. Uh, and so we have a, a pattern. We see what's going on with that female over time because we do this on a monthly basis. Okay. Interessante Methode, also keine Überwinterung, gar nichts, einfach auf die Follikelgröße zu achten. Hier mal zum Zeigen, hier haben wir ein Spotnose-Männchen, ein LB-Männchen, was immer LB heißt. Und dann kommen hier äh, Weibchen, 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 Weibchen. Weibchen, ja, also eine Reihe, fünf Weibchen, da drüben die zwei Männchen und die machen immer so eine Querreihe rüber. Das heißt, die, die Männchen sind alle sozusagen übereinander. Hier haben wir die zwei Männer rein, alles Männer übereinander und die gehen dann immer sozusagen nach rechts, versorgen die ihre Weibchen. Okay, so you said uh, or the, the records here, you, you put all the records on the box directly, yes? Yes, we, we try to keep a lot of our records so that we can see them at a glance. If you take a look at this uh, cage right here, it's a good example of the information that we keep. First thing that we see on this particular cage is, is the animal's number. This is its unique number within our system. This one happens to be 3414. Uh, and I can also see here that in uh, June of 2009, she produced six eggs and zero slugs. Uh, in August of uh, 2011, she produced eight eggs. I can also see here that in uh, 2013, on May the 9th, she was, uh, her follicles were at 1.1 centimeters. June the 17th, they're at 1.3 centimeters. July 19th, 1.6. August the uh, 2nd at 2.8. I can also tell off of this uh, uh, cage card that uh, in June, this particular female weighed 2,631 grams. Uh, we haven't weighed her since that time. This information right here is feed information. We mark the positive feeds in a black ink and the negative feeds in a red ink. This one, this one here, like August 12th, this is uh, the red one, or not? That is correct. On August the 12th, that particular animal was offered feed, but it did not feed on it. Okay, so the Bild zeigt uns jetzt ein paar Highlights aus seiner Collection. Wow. What is it? Is a pinstripe inside something? Pinstripe and desert, or what is yeah, it? I, actually, it's uh, what we believe it is: is fire, butter, pinstripe, enchi. But it may not have the butter in it. I'm not a, a completely sure on that. It may just be fire, pinstripe, enchi. And then here's. This one probably has enchi, fire, butter, pinstripe, possibly pastel in it also. The, the pastel may light it up that much huh, from, from the other one. So more you mean like the other one, but uh, plus the pastel or what? Yeah, the sire on this particular clutch was what's called a nuclear spinner, which would be um, fire, butter, pinstripe, spider, uh, and then the uh, uh, dam on this was an enchi. So I guess there would be no pastel in that, by the way. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, kind of pastel. This is a super gravel. So it's no pastel or something, it's just a super gravel, no pastel inside, nothing. No pastel in it at all. This also is a super gravel, it's a younger one. Um, it will probably lighten up somewhat, probably not as much as this one is lightened up, but it will lighten up. 
This is one of my favorite ones here. This is a pastel highway. I like it because it just, when it came out, I did not expect to see this. I expected to see an animal that looked somewhat different from this. Uh, but uh, to me, it's a very beautiful snake. This is an animal that's a surprise to us. Uh, this is a, as far as we know, it's a super mocha. Uh, and there aren't many of them around, but a super mocha usually comes out as a white snake. For some reason, this just came out as a patternless brown snake. We don't understand why. But the parents was mocha to mocha or? Yes, parents were mocha to mocha. So they might have been like, uh, had something else to had something else, huh? It's possible uh, that they, you know, it could have been hit patternless to hit patternless, but that was unknown to us. So this is the uh, boa section here, right? Yeah, this is our section of boas, and we do several different types of boas here, and also some other pythons. Uh, we do Brazilian rainbow boas. We do quite a few of those. This year we've produced about 2,000 Brazilian rainbow boas. Uh, and then we've also uh, got a, a small setup of uh, uh, Colombian boas, uh, mo mainly hypo-Colombian boas. We don't do many of the morphs of those. Uh, and then we also have some Dumeril's boas. Uh, and then we, in this room, we also keep a number of blood pythons, uh, mainly the uh, Bronger'smi and the uh, Breitensteini. So let's have a look, show me some nice ones. Okay, so this is a salmon or hypoboa, right? Yeah, this is a hypoboa here. And then we have some that are just, this is just a normal Colombian red tail boa here. Ones that we've just grown out and, and, you know, and we'll produce just normal boas out of these. We have a good market for those from some of our customers. This is an example of one of our Brazilian rainbow boas. We have about um, 400 and some, about 450 adult female Brazilian rainbows. Uh, and uh, our colony has just really started to cycle in. Last year we produced about 1,000 babies, this year about 2,000. I think next year we'll produce somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 2,500 babies. More Colombian boas, hypo Colombian boas. Get down here. Here's a uh, Borneo short tailed python, uh, Python uh, Breitenstein eye. You can see it's a little bit it's interested in eating right now. Uh, this one's opaque, but another. Uh, Sure, uh, Borneo short-tailed python. We also have some uh, uh, red blood pythons. This is an example of one here. This is a normal red blood python. This is a 2006 animal, so it's about seven years old. We also have some uh, T positive albino blood pythons. And in fact, we have a number of het for uh, albino females. We have several uh, albi uh, large albino uh, uh, females. Our goal is to produce about 500 of these a year, although we haven't been producing anywhere near that uh, uh, up until now. Our blood python colonies are a young colony. This is a, a baby that we've grown up. Uh, uh, it should be ready for production this next year. Uh, and this is a, a het for T-positive albino. One of the other projects that we've got, and I actually saw it earlier, we're working on uh, Boland's pythons. It's a goal of mine to breed Boland's pythons. And uh, hope we can do it over the next few years. We're growing out several, you know, Actually, we have, in, in the whole group, we have approximately 15 uh, Bolins pythons. Most of those are very young animals, though. If we're successful at breeding the Bolins, it won't be for several years. So. Although we've, we've been able to breed uh, Timor pythons, and, and really other people have not done it. Uh, so so we'll, you know, hopefully we'll 
uh, we'll be able to be successful with the Bolins like we were with the Timos. I will cross my fingers. That would be amazing, absolutely. What we have here is a Timor python. We have a group of about four males and five female Timors. And last year we produced three clutches of, of Timor pythons. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of people have not been successful on breeding Timors. And what we've done is not anything special. We basically don't uh, have much of a thermal gradient for them. Uh, we just make sure that they've got plenty of food uh, and the ambient temperatures kept around 80 degrees. Uh, and um, when we see, and we do ultrasound them, and when we see follicles uh, beginning to develop, that's when we put the males in with the females, and, and it's... Uh, uh, so you didn't do any hibernation, something like this, nothing no, at all? Nothing at all. Nothing to cycle them, we just... Yeah. Just ultrasound and see what's going on. You know, if, if you look at a, there's a, uh, a on one of the uh, internet sources on uh, MoraliaPythons.com, there's an interview with a guy named Terry Phillips, and he talks about keeping it simple on breeding pythons, and uh, that's really what we've done with our Timor pythons. We've just kept it simple. We keep them in a simple cage setup, nothing fancy about it, and, and uh, we've been successful at it. Cool. So, 35 Grad, Florida. Wir haben einiges gefilmt. Wir sind, maybe we have less than half of the whole facility, right? Yes, yes, we've done two of the four buildings. Two of the four buildings, okay. Der perfekte Moment, um eine Pause zu machen. I think it's time for a break. Und ich denke auch, es reicht für eine Episode. Den zweiten Teil seht ihr in der nächsten Folge Reptil TV. Dann war das... Äh, Bill Brands Largest Reptile Breeding in the World, Part 1. Bis zur Folge 2 und uh, check my balls und check Bill's, Bill's Balls. <laughs>